Hey guys, today we are going to do another tutorial in my watercolor basics series. We're going to do an illustration that requires mostly a lot of glazes. So glazes are sort of the staple for my watercolor illustrations. If you enjoy the art that you see here, if you enjoy this tutorial, please uh, take a moment to check out my sponsor, 7-Inch Kara. 7-Inch Kara is a wonderful, beautifully illustrated children's, in fact, all ages, watercolor comic written and illustrated by me. So if you enjoy my art, if you enjoy my tutorials, 7-Inch Kara is the next logical step for more of that. Um, you can get it for $15 over at natosoup.com slash Kara hyphen comic. That is Kara, K-A-R-A hyphen comic, C-O-M-I-C. So we're going to go ahead and get started. This has already been inked with a Sailor Mitsuo Ida brush pin that is waterproof and Copic marker proof. It is my personal brush pin of choice. Um, and we're going to go ahead and erase the pencils using a Tombow mono eraser. And I'll just do that in time lapse. All right, now that that's erased, I'm gonna go ahead and reestablish that mandala I'd sketched around her head or what will become a mandala very lightly in pencil. And then I'm gonna clean that up so we have a nice clean ledge. Uh, edge doesn't have any of that petting. And petting is that sort of sketchy um, tentative line that many, many people do. But it tends to look sloppy and unprofessional, so you do want to clean that up. Now, I opted not to ink that because I do want it to be light and ethereal, and it, I do want it to eventually be covered up. All right, guys, so now we are sort of ready to get started with our painting. I'm going to go ahead and grab an eyedropper. And it's just a pretty simple little pipette. I use these to uh, transfer water from my water container into my weld palette. And um, fine art watercolorists don't really use weld palettes, but I'm not a fine art watercolorist. So I want to show you guys the palette we're mostly going to be working with. Golds, pinks, maybe even a little sea foam. So I'm going to go ahead and start by activating my pigments, just brushing some water onto them. And then I'm going to mix up my skin tone using yellow ochre and scarlet pretty common for a Caucasian skin tone. And you want to go ahead and activate your pigments early. That'll give them time to, you know, release their color, be ready for mixing. So we're going to start off with a glaze, which is a combination of cerulean blue and ultramarine. This is the color I usually use for sky. I try not to fall out of my chair. I'm gonna go ahead and sketch out a box which I may soften with clean water. And if I use any terms in this tutorial that you're not familiar with, I have a glossary of terms as part of my watercolor basics series over on the blog that I really recommend that you guys go ahead and check out. There are lots of great posts in that already, that series from choosing the right paper to you and for you and the right brushes to basic techniques, even some paper reviews, all designed to get you painting 
your illustrations in watercolor. Now a glaze is really just a thin, thin layer of watercolor, which is how you should be handling watercolor anyway. All right. I'm gonna brush out some of the more harsher lines. I'm going to allow this to dry before I continue. When you paint with glazes, patience is your best friend because you really need things to be dry, especially if you're working on inexpensive papers like this Canson Mont Ball, which is what I use when I paint seven inch Cara, but it is not what I use when I am doing longer, larger illustrations. And you can use a thirsty brush. A thirsty brush is a brush that's been dipped in water and then dried out on your paper towel. You can use a thirsty brush to just sort of pick up any pooled pigments. And that way you're not gonna get areas of pooling. You can get a more uniform wash. And it is a little more difficult to get a uniform wash with sedimentary or set of uh, colors that granulate like this wash here and you do want to paint with them almost as soon as you mix them. In fact, I should not have mixed that, but we're going to let this dry and then we'll come back to it. All right, guys, that first layer is dried. And as you can see, it is a very, very pale blue. So we're going to go in and add a glaze of shadow just sort of strategically. This is a dry, um, I mean, a wet on dry application. That is pretty much how you glaze, just layers and layers of, of wet on dry. And you're gonna want to work with the biggest brush you can comfortably handle. So I could go a little bigger than this, honestly, but, uh, my larger brushes are unfortunately being conditioned right now. So I just have to be patient. And if you're working with larger brushes, you can safely use a synthetic. I find that the really nice Kalinsky sables really shine when I, uh, not when I'm doing little fills like this, but when I'm trying to draw details now, a synthetic won't hold as much water as a nice natural fiber brush, but they're much more affordable. So if you're just getting started, don't feel bad if you need to use a synthetic. So we're gonna do a little blending. We cleaned our brush with clean water. Clean is the key. And we're just going to soften some of the transitions. And I'm dabbing excess water off onto a paper towel. Then I'm going to just go in and pick up any of the water that might have pooled. And let that dry as well. All right, so that second layer has dried. And you guys can see that as long as we're working in very thin washes, you're not going to get a lot of change in color. So let's add some more blue. And while we wait for that to dry, I'm gonna go ahead and mix up that skin color. And it's gonna be handled as a glaze as well, but I can't apply it until the background is dry because there are areas of the background that are touching areas of the skin. You can work continuously so long as you're not applying wet onto wet or else there will be bleed. And you might want bleed, but in this case, I don't. And we're just going to continue to handle this as very light glazes. So I'm going to let this glaze dry and I'll get back to you guys 
once that is dried. All right, guys, that layer of blue has dried. Now we can start our first layer of skin tone. Still working with the largest brush I can manage. These larger brushes are good for blocking things in, but at this size, they're really not ideal for detail. And the reason you want to work with the largest size you can handle is it helps prevent your work from becoming muddy too quickly. And as you guys can see, her skin is very, very pale right now. But we're going to build up depth of color through glazing. Of course, as soon as I blot away some paint, dang it. See, that's one of the really big problems in my opinion with these synthetics is that they just drip the paint. And this is a Utrecht Red Sable blend so it's good for blocking in that background. Bad because it just sort of lets go of the paint. Allowing it to splatter everywhere. So it's really good if you need to do splatter effects with like white gouache or ink or even watercolor because it does not hold on too tightly. And something you need to keep in mind when watercoloring is that your color is going to dry lighter than what you put down. Now I do want to prevent pooling as light as this is, especially on the face. So I'm just going to go in with a thirsty brush, just like we talked about earlier, and absorb that excess paint. And I will let that dry and come back in a little bit. All right, guys, that layer of skin has dried. I'm gonna go ahead and mix my skin tone a little darker, a little more yellow ochre, a little more scarlet. And I am also going to try to create a pink that will match that washi tape I showed you guys at the beginning of the video. But I'll go ahead and paint my skin so that can dry while I am mixing. So we're going to switch to a smaller brush. I'm using a Winsor Newton Series 7 in A2. I think I originally bought this for inking, but I didn't really care for it as an inking brush as the bristles are so long and I'm so heavy handed. I mixed that too pink. So with glazing, the intention is to build up translucent areas of shadow in color. Um, and it's one of my favorite ways to work. So right now I am designating the shadow on her face as cast by her bangs. Also designating which side of the face would be turned away from the light source. One of the beautiful things about glazing is that you have the option to either have harsh lines or diffuse blended colors. It's really easy to do because you're working with such thin layers of color. And in case you guys are wondering, I am working with a self-assembled mixed palette of my favorite colors, many of which are, I must admit, pre-mixed convenience colors. I don't like buying my skin tones pre-mixed though because they just never seem to work out right. And it is a combination of Winsor Newton moist pan, semi-moist pans, Winsor Newton tubes that have been dried, Soho watercolors, which are a Jerry's Artorama brand, which have been dried. Um, those are a very inexpensive uh, brand, but they are not light fast. They're not archival. And uh, a few uh, Hobian and uh, Daniel Smith tube watercolors that have been dried in pans. And you can purchase half pans online or at Jerry's or through Jerry's. Um, they're really not hard to find. And I find that I don't really have a problem with my tube watercolors reactivating. I know some artists say they do. I have not really encountered many which are problematic. So we have applied our skin like this. And I'm just going to absorb with a thirsty brush any 
additional pooled color and grab a picture for the blur. And now we're going to try to mix a color that will match what this pink in the washi tape or even a little darker ideally. It's going to be a little hard. So I'm starting with Scarlet and I'm going to grab a little bit of Holbein's Cherry Red. It's from their Iridori line. And Cherry Red is a blue red. And you think that might work. Now just, you should really swatch it on the paper you're using. Maybe that's a little blue. Let me clean that. And go back, see if we can't. Maybe a little more scarlet. You should really do your swatching on paper of the same type you're going to be painting on. But you know, I often don't do the things I should do, so. Anyway, I need to let this dry before I can continue, so I'm going to step away for a moment, refresh my water since it is dirty, and I will be back. All right, guys, so that layer of skin has dried. Now I'm going to go ahead and start adding in the blush, and I'm going to use the same blush that I use, I'm going to use on her dress. So when I apply blush, it is a glaze, and I usually blend it out. So I apply it across the bridge of her nose. Let me zoom in for you guys. Clean my brush with clean water. Wipe away the excess on a paper towel. And then I use that to blend it out so it's not a harsh line. And then I like to put it on tops of her eyelids. Blend that as well. Remember, it is going to dry lighter. I know it looks a little bit like a pink raccoon mask right now. Tips of her ear, under her nose, on her lips, under her chin. So basically where skin is going to meet skin, I'm going to apply blush. I'll just soak up that extra on the ear. Also, on her knees and I'm going to blend a lot of this out so that it doesn't look too cartoony to fill in the blanks because the intention this isn't intended to be the shading it's just intended to give some vitality to her skin okay and I want that to dry a little bit before I start painting in her dress. So I'll check in in a couple of minutes. Now while that dries, I'm gonna go ahead and mix up some green for her sleeves and her hair color. And I'm using an inexpensive squirrel brush from Jerry's for this. Ooh. A little too generous. Let's see if I can sop some of that color up. And that needs to mimic a mint green that I have. So it's going to need a little bit of blue. In fact, we could take some of that blue maybe. Also start mixing up the brown for her hair. and clean that brush. All right, so it looks like her skin is dry. I can do another layer of glaze. So I'm going to intensify the blush on just her cheeks and the very ends of her eyelids and on her lip. Tip of the ear too. 
hand on her knees. And then with clean water, I'm going to blend that out a little bit so we don't get any harsh lines. And I'm going to paint over that with skin tone and it'll help solidify it and help make it look like it belongs together. Right now it looks a little disparate. We're going to use a size four brush. We're going to go ahead and start painting the bodice and skirt of her dress. Now it looks like the blush on her cheeks is going to be too intense. So I blot it a little bit with that piece of paper towel. And that's one of the reasons why I like Viva. They make a unpatterned and untextured paper towel that is really good for just simple cleanup, simple mis uh, fixing of mistakes. Not going to leave a texture behind. You might want a texture um, in your watercolor and corrections. There are opportunities to use that as a technique. But for me, I want it to be a fairly seamless cleanup when it comes to skin. All right, so that needs to dry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wipe out the excess water from the brush and just use it to dab up a little bit of pooled paint and use a little bit of paper towel to pick up a little bit of um, overflow and we're going to let this dry. All right, guys, that layer of pink has dried and we're going to move back on to the skin. And you want to give your paint a good mix. If you've let it sit for a while, clean out your brush and then go back into it again. That way, if you have any, uh, any of your pigments settled out, you know, you can get them resuspended. Now with glazing, each layer you paint, you want to cover a little bit less or a lot less, but you always want to make sure you're covering less than the layer before. Otherwise, you're kind of def def defeating the purpose of doing a glaze. All right, now that is applied. I'm going to go ahead and blend certain areas so that they're a little bit softer so that the transition isn't so harsh. And of course, we'll let that dry. All right, guys, that layer has had time to dry. So I'm going to go ahead and apply the first layer of hair. And it's going to be a pretty thin, light layer Actually, that's too thin, too light. You know what? On second thought, I'm going to do the eyeshadow real quick. Because I need to do that before I do the hair anyway. So I'll zoom in for you guys. And I'll go ahead and apply another layer to her dress. So as you guys can see, glazing is just a really, really simple technique. There's really not a whole lot to it other than patience and a little bit of fine motor skill, hand-eye coordination. But as a technique, while not flashy, it definitely gets the job done. And it's one of those things that once you know how to do it, it will serve you for the rest of your painting career. 
I'm not really a big fan of fancy techniques or trying to make things seem complicated just to make what I do appear to have more value. All right, so I'm going to blend the glaze on her top, but leave the glaze on her skirt sharp. And I need to, I'm gonna, hmm. Since the dress takes up so much space, there isn't a whole lot I can work on that isn't adjacent to it. Clean up that bit of collar. So I need to let this dry before I can come back to it and continue working. All right, now that that layer has dried with the dress, I'm gonna go ahead and start the skin with this size four brush and we're really just blocking it in right now. It's still kind of light. There we go. See, I didn't even take my own advice. I should have mixed the paint because it settled out. And same as before, if you have pooling, you can soak that up with a thirsty brush. And I'm gonna go ahead and mix it a bit darker. So I do use the base layer for hair as the color for freckles, at least on Kara. And then using a size two brush, just gonna start drawing the freckles in. All right, I'm gonna let that first layer of freckles dry but since none of that is touching the shirt, and now to let that dry. All right, guys, so those layers seem to be dry. Clean out my brush just in case. You don't ever want to have that wonderful surprise where you go to do something and there's a whole nother color that you accidentally left. And I really recommend not working with your water cup across from where your hand needs to be, but due to the limitations of recording, that is just sort of inevitable. So, Sometimes I will let my skin tone uh, evaporate overnight to get darker. Ooh, that's gonna be too much yellow ochre, I can tell. But I'm gonna try to get this one knocked out tonight. Although it is getting pretty late, so that might just not be possible. So I am darkening up my skin tone and going right over those freckles. And you guys see that I have bulldog clips on the side of the page. That is because even though this is a 140 pound uh, Canson Montval paper, it is very, very prone to buckling if you don't stretch it. And even, even clamped down like this, it is kipping a little bit. So. to hold the paper sort of straight at least. I went ahead and clamped it down. And we're on like our fifth, maybe even our sixth, sixth 
skin tone glaze. So as you can see, if you're using glazing as a painting technique, it really does take some patience because it will take a lot of time. And I know that is the big complaint that a lot of people have is um, their watercolor doesn't go very well because they just don't have a lot of patience. And um, I usually work on multiple pieces at one time. In fact, uh, when I'm not recording this one, I'm working on a digital piece. So I feel you, I understand where you're coming from and I just have to work on other things. So I'm going to soak up the extra, the pooled skin tone and wipe it and let that dry. And I've zoomed in to show you that we're getting a fair amount of contrast on her arms here and definitely on her face. That's one of the things I really like about glazing is you can get a nice bounce of color. So I'm not going to go any darker with her skin. I'm just gonna work on building up the other colors. All right guys, those layers have dried. It's time to make some more progress. And I'm going to move on back into this dark, well, this middling brown, I guess. Let's go ahead and give it a mix. Not getting much darker, that's okay. Soon we're gonna switch over to concentrated color mixed up from the pan. Paper's starting to kip, so I just went ahead and put a clip at the top since I won't be painting in that area for a while and it's completely dry. Switch back over to a smaller brush. Add another layer of freckles. I'm not trying to darken up the ones that are already there, but freckles um, will sort of come in layers. So I'm trying to use a delicate hand to do that. Go back into the green. Hmm. Need to mix that darker, I guess. It's hard enough to mix it the first time, unfortunately. Because with glazing, even though it seems like we're only applying thin layers of color and not doing much color tweaking, what we're really trying to do is build up contrast with our watercolor. So you do want there to be a noticeable difference between layers. Otherwise, it'll really start to look muddy. That's why I told you earlier in the video that we need to, um, each layer should cover less than the one before. helps build up contrast. All right, guys, now that that layer is dried, it's time to make a little more progress. And I mean, if you're a painter who utilizes glazing, painting on a wet day is just gonna be a nightmare. I've had something that on a dry day could be done very quickly. Like today, things are drying very quick. Um, but I've had something that could have taken me very little time, end up taking the whole day just due to ridiculous dry times. It's actually why I stopped offering um, at con watercolor commissions because, you know, two of the states I do my, the most cons in, Louisiana and Tennessee, well, Louisiana is Louisiana. And uh, my dry times were just unreasonable. 
for me. Um, it, it made it it made it impossible to fill those sort of commissions at the show. So I quit offering them. Well, that and people would come back to ask like every 10 minutes, like, come on, man, this is watercolor. There is no way it could have been f completed in this amount of time. I mean, even something very simple like what I'm doing here for you guys, um, with as quick a dry time as it's having, it's still taken a couple of hours to work on. All right. I think I am going to let this dry overnight and come back tomorrow and finish things up. So by allowing this to dry overnight, I'm going to do some complementary color shading and uh, that's going to help prevent these colors from picking up immediately. So if you utilize a lot of glazing in your watercolor technique arsenal, um, you do want to be a little bit strategic about how you do things and in what order you do things. Plus, it is actually incredibly late, so there's really no pressing need to finish this tonight. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. All right, guys, this piece has had a chance to dry overnight. So we're gonna go back in and just darken up specific areas. And I actually allowed my paints to sit overnight. There are conflicting thoughts on that because dust or animal dander can drift into it. I do have it up on my drafting table and I do shut my cat out at night. So there wouldn't be any additional cat hair drifting into it, but I'm sure there's still some in the air that could. But it also allows my colors a chance to evaporate and concentrate a bit. So in that regard, it's actually useful for me to do this. Of course, the colors have to be stirred again after they've sat all night. Here. Got too greedy, worked too fast. And you know what? I'll just leave it like that since the green is a contrasting color anyway. And it doesn't have too far to spread. And I'll go ahead and reactivate some of the colors that I'm going to need for today. And give those a chance to, those pigments a chance to get worked in. give this a chance to dry. All right guys, now that that has had a chance to dry, I went ahead and I mixed some darker colors into the pink that I'm using on Kara's dress. And I'm about to mix a little bit of darker uh, green and a little bit of blue into the color that I use on her sleeves. And unfortunately for me, the color on her sleeves wants to settle out very quickly. So it has to constantly be remixed. And I'll go ahead and start working on her hair again. And we're working pretty much direct from the pan now. And I'm also going to fill in her mouth with a naphthol red. So a little bit off topic. This is a 
Vermeer Utrecht Kulinski Red Sable. And something I always thought interesting is that um, a lot of a lot of art stores will name their store brand stuff after famous artists, but it often has no relation to the actual product. So like there are Van Gogh watercolors and Van Gogh was not known for his watercolors, for example, or Vermeer was not known for his watercolors either. And I'm sure there are watercolorists that we could be honoring um, rather than giving that honor to dead masters who painted in oils and tempera. But, you know, I guess they want to go with names they think people will recognize instead of trying to develop recognition. I don't know. If I were a more serious watercolorist, if I were a fine art watercolorist, I would probably be kind of ticked off about it. But, you know, to be honest, literally nothing is named after comic people, so... And very little is named after animators either. And I know it looks like she has no teeth right now. I'm going to go back in with some white gouache. and paint in her teeth. You guys can't see it, but I have a big gray beast on my lap who is swishing his tail furiously. He's angry that I'm trying to paint around him. So uh, he's making it a little difficult to, oh no, that's too much, I ruined that. He's angry that I'm trying to work around him. He's gonna take as much space as possible All right, now to let that dry. All right, so that has dried. And I think we're nearing the end of this stage of this particular piece. Soon we'll be applying the shadows and working on details. Before we get too far into that, I do want to darken the background, make it more blue. Because contrast is your friend with watercolor. A lot of artists are afraid to go too dark, but if you really want a striking children's book sort of style, you really need to spend the time to make sure your colors are right. to add detail, to rework things. So while this blue background dries, I'm gonna go ahead and mix up a shadow color for skin. And I do that with naphthal red and a little bit of purple or even mauve, depending on the lighting in the picture. And I'm also going to mix up a general shading color, which is indigo blue, Payne's gray, and a little bit of purple. You can also use Holbein's neutral tint. It is a wonderful color. It's a very, uh, it's a gray blue purple, but it is a little more saturated than that. And it works really well. When I'm working with both palettes, I do tend to use that as a base, but Due to space limitations, I'm down to one palette, so. And you want to be careful if you're using Winsor Newton's indigo from the half pan or the moist half pan because um, it tends to be a very blue green. It tends to be very cold, so it can kind of wreck your skin tones if you're applying it to skin tones. So I need to allow, I mean, the background is pretty much dry. I guess I could get started with the skin. And I actually went too purple 
with this particular shadow color. I should have gone more red. Yeah, that's way too purple, unfortunately. You see how it makes the skin tone look muddy instead of shadowed? That should have been more red. And I guess I can try and remedy it by adding some red to it now, but it's a little bit like trying to put the horse back in the stable after it's gone now. Anyway, though, I do need to let that dry before I can continue. Okay, now that that layer is dried, we can go in with another, and I'm going to use a much finer brush this time. And you guys can see how much that purple grayed out the skin. Which is unfortunate. really ended up being more purple than I'd wanted. But I'll try to rescue it in a little bit. And we'll see if that can work. Sometimes by adding another layer of the skin tone, you can rescue really grayed out, muddy looking skin. Right, now that that layer's dry, we're going to carefully use a little bit of the skin color to try and uh, bring some life, I guess, back into areas that are just particularly desaturated. And you have to be really careful with doing it like this because it can quickly become overworked, which is something that I fear the whole piece, honestly, is suffering from. And to be really honest, cheaper papers like Canson Montval are very prone to becoming overworked very quickly. Um, when you put too much paint on them, they tend to get chalky uh, and colors lose their vibrancy. And as I've mentioned before, this is the paper I use when I paint Kara pages, but it's more because it is very affordable than it is because I just love it. Because I don't just I don't just love it. I just need to work within my means. And I know it looks really, really, really dark. So we're gonna blend it out a little bit with some clean water and use a paper towel to blot some of it up. And if I can't get this to work, I'm just going to move on with it. I'm having a pretty hard time this morning. Mostly trying to work around that cat. You also get muddiness when you start to lose your contrast, and that's another problem that I'm having with this. All right, guys, this has had plenty of time to dry. I am actually really disappointed by how muddy it's looking. At least her skin. All right, now we gotta leave this alone because it's not gonna get any better from here on. The best I could do is re reestablish those freckles, but I need to wait to do that. All right, guys, now that the skin tone has dried, it is time for us to go ahead and start applying that shadow color elsewhere. Anyone 
want to be careful about not scrubbing on cheaper papers like this Canson Montval because it'll remove uh, prior layers of paint. Even if you're working while everything is still wet, that's just unfortunately one of the downsides of inexpensive watercolor papers. You can see, let me zoom in for you guys. You can see on the bodice, if I kept moving the paint, it would have removed more of it. And you can see down here where it would do the same. So that is definitely something you wanna be wary of when you're working on inexpensive papers. They tend not to take layering very well, even if you allow for ample drawing time. One of the plus sides is they do dry faster than more expensive papers because um, I guess the wood pulp dries out quicker than the cotton rag would. Okay, so now we can start working, um, finishing up the hair, adding uh, freckles again, and uh, working on highlights. So I'm gonna remix the base hair color. Since I've been using that for freckles, it does tend to settle out. And add those back into areas where they got kind of muted with all the layers. So definitely on the neck. And now in the hair, I'm using some Van Dyke Brown. All right, so we are nearing the end of this, thankfully enough. And um, so what's really left is adding maybe a little bit of darker shadow, just here and there. And then adding highlights. And then in a different tutorial, we're gonna talk about um, we're gonna talk about using washi tape to add another dimension to your artwork. So um, I hope you guys look forward to that as well. And unfortunately for me, this piece didn't go quite as well as I'd envisioned, but I hope you guys enjoyed watching me work on it. And I hope you were able to learn something. Ugh or at least feel, felt inspired to maybe try a new watercolor technique. Glazing is honestly very easy to do, but it is very time consuming. All right, so let's see, that leaves a little bit of the hair. And we're gonna go over to sepia. We're just gonna knock in the darkest shadow. And let that dry. All right guys, for this part of the project, we are in the home stretch. We're pretty much just going to be adding, um, I do actually wanna add a little more shadow color over there under that arm, but we're mostly just gonna be adding white highlights. And you can use white gouache, which is a type of opaque watercolor, or you can use Copic Opaque White. And it really, my preference is really just whatever I have at the table, on the table at the time, because they're very similar. So I'm going to use Copic Opaque White. And this is water soluble until fully dry, whereas gouache is water soluble, sometimes even after it's dry, depending on which brand you use and which type you use. Um, there are acrylic gouaches that are completely permanent once dry. And this clip has got to go because it is in my way.
This does too. I'm gonna have to reclip it though. And using a white highlight or a white watercolor or a white gouache is a good way to add a little bit of the contrast that you might have lost in rendering. You don't want to be too heavily reliant on it. It won't work miracles for you. But it can help replace some of the bounce that sometimes gets lost. All right, so our highlights have been added. At this point, you could consider this tutorial over. I am going to add in a mandala in time lapse as that's part of my idea for the illustration. So um, if uh, I guess I'll see you guys at the end of the video. All right, guys, so this is the conclusion on our tutorial on watercoloring using very thin glazes and washes. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. Next in the lineup is going to be using washi tape to add another layer of dimension and excitement to your art. So please keep an eye out for that. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. And if you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, just leave a comment down below. Um, if you really enjoyed this video, if you really found it helpful and you know someone who would also enjoy it or, you know, you just want to share it with your friends and family, please do so by using the social network links down below. You sharing my videos to your friends, family, and loved ones really helps me out a lot. It helps me expand my audience. It lends credibility to my work. Both of those are very important things. If you really enjoy this sort of content, head on over to the blog, natosoup.blogspot.com for more of my watercolor basic series, as well as loads of tips, tricks, tutorials, and reviews surrounding all around comics, watercolor, and art supplies. If you would like to help make more content like this possible, head on over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash natosoup for information on how to join my community of art nerds. Patreons get exclusive content made just for them. They get early access to videos and they get priority voting on what's next in the queue. So if all of that sounds ideal to you, that is the place where you should be. I'm Becca Hilburn. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today in my studio. If you get a chance, go over to natosoup.com slash Kara hyphen comic to check out the comic that this cute little gal is from. And I'll see you guys again really soon. Bye.